Welcome to this joint seminar by the Center for Financial Studies, CFS, and the Institute for Banking and Financial History, IBF, um, both uh, at Goethe University Frankfurt. My name is Rainer Klump. I'm uh, one of the scientific directors of uh, CFS. And I also um, welcome our two speakers of this afternoon, Ludger Schuknecht and uh, Harold James. Let me say in the beginning that this seminar will be recorded and the video and the slides that uh, Ludger Schuknecht will present will be made available over the websites of both uh, institutes afterwards. Let me briefly introduce our two protagonists, uh, Ludger Schuknecht, who is currently spending a sabbatical and lecturing at Goethe University in Frankfurt, has studied economics in Munich and George Mason University. He got a PhD from Constance University. He served uh, with the IMF, uh, the WTO and uh, the ECB where he had it um, the financial, uh, the fiscal surveillance uh, section. Uh, he became chief economist at the German Ministry of Finance from 2011 to 2018, before becoming one of the deputy secretary generals of the OECD until September of last year. Ludger's research has been devoted to fiscal policy at large. Let me just mention the book that he published in 2000 together with Vito Tansi from IMF, a study titled Public Spending in the 20th Century, a Global Perspective. And this subject is taken, uh, taken up again in his uh, recently published book titled Public Spending and the Role of the State, History, Performance, Risk and Remedies. Uh, that is um, the topic of uh, today's talk. Um, as we all see, the corona crisis and the policy measures to deal with it have already led to an intensive debate about uh, the future role, size, and effectiveness of the public sector. And Lutke contributes to this debate, and uh, we look very much forward to his presentation. Harry James, who um, is joining us, kindly joining us from Princeton, uh, has started his career at Cambridge and uh, teaches in Princeton at the university as a professor of uh, history and uh, at the Woodrow Wilson School as a professor of international politics. Um, he is uh, certainly one of the leading economic historians in the world and if I may say so, a good friend of uh, the Frankfurt House of Finance and its institutions. Uh, Harold, we are very happy to have you with us and look forward to your comments. But now the floor is open for Lutka. Thank you very much, Rainer. Um, and thank you very much to the IBF and the CFS for organizing this event and inviting me. Harold, thank you for uh, also sharing this event with me and uh, to all of you for attending. I hope I will not disappoint you with this presentation of my book, um, Public Spending and the Role of the State, which as Rainer said is in parts an update, the first part, the historical part, an update also of that book I did with Vito Tanzi 20 years ago, but it, in the other part it goes beyond that. And um, I, 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 given that it's a joint uh, event also of the Institute and of the CFS, uh, I think I'd like to spend also a bit more time on the historical part of, of uh, the historical analysis of this book. Um, as, as main messages, I would like to start by saying that government spending and the, the development of government and government spending has been key uh, in improving our lives and opportunities over the past 150 years. I think that is, that is really a very important message. Um, and at the same time, as government spending and the role of government has developed, we have seen a huge growth in government spending over the past 150 years, but 
In the book, I also argue that in many countries, this spending growth has gone further than necessary um, because there are big differences in the performance in the, of the role of the state. And um, some countries are, so to speak, better at spending than others. And um, Luca, will you share your slides? Yeah, I will share them in a minute. I thought I do the main messages a bit without the distraction of the slides, and then I, I jump into the slides. Yeah. And um, in this history of public spending, I also discuss a, a number of countries that have reformed the state very successfully over the past three decades, so four decades since the 1980s. And they have combined uh, expenditure reform, expenditure reduction with the reinvigoration and improvement in the role of the state, including some of the countries that uh, were in the Euro crisis. Um, at the same time, you know, while we've had this large growth in the spending state, we have also big risks for the future from, from uh, population aging that we all know, but also from the financial sphere, which is perhaps less known and people are less aware of, which is numerically perhaps the biggest risk. So what are, the, what are the normative conclusions from this positive analysis? To my mind, we need better spending, and in most countries, certainly not more spending, but in all countries, we could do better. And the way to go about this, I think, is rules-based policymaking, rules-based in terms of you know, the macro objectives, constraining debt, constraining over-indebtedness, but also on the micro side by having good and sound institutions for spending and budget making and in the financial sphere. So let me know, give you um, a few, give, connect you with my slides. Um, let me see that I, I hope that works. So I, I look at this uh, question of the role of the state and public spending. Um, from two angles, from the what we today see kind of as mainstream is, is a bit the Keynesian angle of allocative efficiency, stabilization, and income distribution, but also from the angle of the more classical economic thinking, which looked at the role of the state in providing rules of the game and uh, sound basic uh, public goods. And um, I think both approaches have their, have their merit. Um, the classical approach looks more at the functioning of the market processes and uh, the opportunities therein and government, strong government actually, as Adam Smith already stressed, uh, providing such uh, good rules of the game, being the referee therein and sound uh, public goods and services. And the um, Keynesian approach is more outcome oriented. And that I think is justified also from the perspective of monitoring government, you know, of seeing really, okay, what do we get for spending? What do we get in terms of uh, prosperity, stability, income distribution? So I think uh, the two approaches are not mutually exclusive. Um, and one of the first claims of the book uh, that I uh, aim to substantiate is that when it comes to spending, um, why, what, what's really, what do we really want to achieve? We want to achieve that people trust the government in doing its role and doing its role well. And here you see something very interesting to my mind, and that is spending itself is not correlated with trust in government. What you see is the correlation between trust in own governments of people, results uh, from the uh, surveys, the European surveys, and the kind of the outcomes of government activity. So here I show you, as you see on the left, no correlation between public spending or social spending and the trust in government, but strong correlation between what we expect from government, what we expect government to deliver, uh, the rule of law with the strongest correlation, but also low public debt, infrastructure quality, education quality, uh, more of that in the book. So, um, this kind of role of government today has been evolving over the last 150 years. You know that the late 19th century when kind of first good 
statistics became available on uh, on spending, or when we or we have good statistics from that period, reasonably good. Uh, it was more the, the period of the minimal state with little regulation, but already at that time, um, infrastructure investment, uh, public education, and social security were kind of initiated and started developing. Um, but the, the, the real growth or the real development of strong public administrations, public goods and services happened, I would say, between the, the, this period before World War I and 1960, when uh, extensive public services and basic safety nets were developed. And many today are, you know, often reminisce about the 1960s as the period when, so to speak, government was not too big and still uh, societies were peaceful, happy, and uh, public services were, were functioning well. After that, uh, we went through the Keynesian revolution when public spending increased hugely. Um, thereafter, we had a bit of a counter revolution, Thatcher, Reagan, and be in, the, in the shadow of that, actually many countries reforming the role of the state, uh, ro some of them rolling back spending, before, since the turn of the millennium, really, I think we have seen more of a return of government activism and actually some uh, more renewed growth of government spending, especially of government spending outside interest expenditure. And what we also, what also the book describes is that um, the, the biggest governments are in continental Europe. And the Anglo-Saxon countries, Eastern Europe, emerging economies, also Switzerland, tend to have smaller governments than these countries. Um, so this is a bit kind of like the aggregate. What I, I'll show you in a minute the sample of countries discussed in the book. Uh, little more than 10% of GDP in 1870, growing to almost 30% in 1960, then uh, to about four, a little, 45% in 2017. And then now we have had COVID with another major explosion of public expenditure, and I'll come back to that at the end. So this only very briefly, it shows you the, the book looks at 22 advanced countries and goes through that a bit in detail. Uh, one, to my mind, interesting phenomenon is that the Nordic countries, which had amongst the smallest governments in the late 19th centuries, of course, are now amongst the biggest. And then we have some countries, well-known countries with big government like France, you know, relatively big in 1870 and big today. And uh, so we've, we've Switzerland relatively big in 1870 and small today, Australia as well. So there are some interesting patterns here, but I just want to show you these aggregate numbers. Here, 2017, the average 44%, much smaller in Europe's emerging countries and outside Europe as well, except perhaps Hungary. So this is the picture of the last 20 years, where you can see the total and primary expenditure dynamics. I find this period very interesting because you can see something that, that, um, that uh, is, is quite, um, quite interesting. The, the boom years of 2000 to 2007 basically didn't see much expenditure saving. Everybody was spending a lot of money. Then came the financial crisis with a big increase. Then the post-crisis period with reforms in some countries and moderate declines before now with COVID uh, public spending has uh, shot up to new record highs. And what's the money spent on? I think this is also from a historic perspective very interesting. Um, in the late 19th century, infrastructure investment as a share of GDP was not much lower than today. Also, debt service, military spending absorbed a lot of uh, public, a uh, big share of the public spending. Education, social welfare, very little. By 1960 and after two world wars, spending had increased a lot, as I had said. And uh, this meant that especially the public administration, education, uh, infrastructure to some extent increased, but especially social services started increasing. And that continued until about 1980. Um, after that, it was only social spending that has increased. 
not education, not public consumption, only social spending. And the social spending share of GDP is in the 2010s was around one quarter of GDP, more than half of public spending, and three times the share of GDP as in 1960. And what many people don't know, I think, is that education is only about one fifth of social spending and one eighth of total spending. And another interesting uh, historical fact is that small governments, governments with spending of less than 40%, do not spend less on investment and little less on education. The big difference across countries is really social and to some extent administration. And here you can see how, um, how, we have, uh, how the composition of spending has changed over time. Um, at the, the education in 80, 17, 2017, uh, increased as a share of total spending, uh, investment declined, and you see social expenditure less than 10% of total spending in 1817, now between 50 and 60%. Um, now, I think that these historical facts are interesting by itself, but of course, a ne the next question is really, what do we get for the money? Um, is it worse for citizens to have higher public spending? What, what do they get in return? And uh, here the book analyzes uh, the two kind of argumentative strands, you know, opportunities, classical indicators versus Keynesian indicators, income distribution, performance, stability. And uh, I look at a number of indicators and um, and kind of then make composite indicators of that. There's a big literature on it. Um, you know, there's a lot of caveats to this measurement challenge um, because it depends very much on how you weight them. And, uh, but I, I'll, uh, on the whole, uh, the finding was that small governments do perform better than medium-sized or big ones. Um, and the efficiency differences, of course, are even greater because efficiency is performance relative to money spent. Um, some big governments have more equal income distribution at the price of higher taxes and more unemployment and less growth, but not this, this uh, equalizing effect on income distribution holds, for, these are mainly the Nordic countries and Belgium, but it doesn't hold for all countries. France, for instance, has the same, uh, roughly the same income distribution as Switzerland, but spends 56% uh, of GDP and Switzerland 33 or 34. So um, what, you, what I sh briefly show on this slide is uh, the, the, the last 17 years uh, relative per capita GDP developments. You can see here, when you standardize all these countries to 100, the small governments to 100, you see that the gap between the small and the medium and big governments has grown over this 20 year periods in, in 2000. The big and small governments had roughly the same per capita GDP, PPP adjusted, purchasing power parity adjusted. And now the, the gap has really grown. And on the right, you see these aggregate performance indicators. And you see on the left and uh, in the top, uh, really Switzerland, Australia, Ireland, as kind of countries with relatively small governments, but also a big, uh, good performance. And then you have a couple of countries that are on the opposite end. Um, now, then the question is, has this, has this kind of been a pattern that did not change over time? Or have there been countries that, so to speak, got out of their trouble? And um, the book goes into detail into three reform waves. Um, but let me just pick out a few. I mean, I think the, a well-known success story is Ireland, which in the 1980s, I, I hope I don't any, offend anybody by saying this, but there seemed to be not much more than butter and, and good beer. But um, you know, now Ireland is one of the most successful countries in Europe and globally. Um, and uh, then if you look at the 2010s, uh, you had as a almost basket case as the start of the decade, a country like Portugal. But thanks to the reforms that were part of the program, the reform program, uh, you know, 
Portugal made huge progress on, um, on many fronts, for instance, on education. You can see that in the indicators. And, uh, and uh, so you can see that, um, you know, the, 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 the historic patterns is not totally something that uh, kind of predetermines whether you have big inefficient government or small and efficient one, but there are differences across countries. And um, I think uh, there's, there's some good, good cases to learn from where, in a way, expenditure reform then led to better spending and better government. And just maybe to share you a slide which runs counter to what many people say about the so-called austerity episodes in the 2010s after the global financial crisis. I don't know whether you can see this because the, 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 the fonts are relatively small, but on the left, you have the Gini coefficient, so to speak, but before the financial crisis and then in 2017. And that, that's the change in the Gini coefficient for the reforming and the non-reforming countries. And you can see the non-reforming countries here, France, Germany, Italy. In all these countries, income distribution became more unequal. A higher Gini coefficient means more inequality. But the pattern, the picture is much more differentiated for the reforming countries. And even though many people claim austerity gave us all these problems, social problems, inequality, it's not true. Ireland, Portugal, and the UK saw improving income distribution. Only Greece and Spain um, became more equal. And then on the right of this slide, you can see the economic dynamism in the recovery, 2014 to 2017. You see the decline in unemployment in these reforming countries, the increase in private consumption, investment, and growth, much more dynamic, much more buoyant than the non-reforming countries. Partly, of course, naturally the result of, uh, you know, after the big downturn that you expect some recovery, but the dynamism is still impressive. Um, also, <laughs> in the reforming countries, trust in government recovered um, after the crisis and with the reforms, especially in the more successful reforming countries, you know, less in Greece, more in Portugal. So then the book dwells also on the question of optimal government. Here, I don't want to say too much um, because it is very subjective. But as I would said before, when you look at spending and these performance indicators, you see that some of the highest indicators are in countries with relatively low spending. Uh, Switzerland is really one of the cases, one of the examples there. Um, but more interestingly, perhaps on the right, and more surprisingly perhaps for you, is that when you look at, for instance, education performance measured by PISA, the number on the left here is not the PISA score, but it's a normalized score uh, with the average set at one. Uh, you see that you know, you, the, the best performers are Japan, Korea, Canada, and Finland. But while Japan and Korea achieved these best results with three and a half percent of public of GDP of public spending, Finland spends almost six and a half. And in that Finland group, you have countries doing much more poorly, and also in that Japan, Korea, low spending group. So I mean, and you can see the same for public infrastructure, for health. Uh, higher spending is not well correlated with performance. And in the case of Japan, Korea, you may say they spend more on private education, the societies are more homogeneous. True, but this does not explain the difference or only a small share of that. So, and when you look at Germany, for instance, going closer to home, public spending on education has increased very strongly in the last 10 years, but the PISA scores actually at best one can say stagnated. They even had a tendency to decline. So um, what, what is the conclusion from that? We need better spending. And I think the, the issue of that we need better spending, not more spending, and in many countries we could live with less, is underpinned by the fact that we have huge fiscal risks in our systems, I should say. First, uh, from population aging, and second from the financial sector. Now population aging, you all know, this is a graph that shows on the, the left column is the spending, social spending 2015, 24% of GDP. And then the five columns to the right are the 
range of estimates for sp social spending in 2050. But even in the most optimistic case, it would go up by 3% of GDP, in the least optimistic by over 10% of GDP. And uh, that means, I mean, 3% of GDP is the whole, uh, whole public infrastructure budget on average in industrial countries. So this is additional spending that we will have that we need to finance that risks to crowd out other productive spending. So this is really a huge challenge, the future of social spending. And then let me to conclude, of almost conclude, spend a minute or two on the risks from the financial sector. These, this describes the transmission channels from asset prices, financing costs of government, the banking bailout costs, central bank risks, international transmission. But let me just show you a few numbers here to, to, to show you that this is a very, very important risk. The left part only shows the costs of bank bailouts in the global financial crisis. And this was up to 36% of GDP in Ireland, 35 in Greece. And then we had a number of countries with double digit costs, including Germany. But that was not the only thing that drove up public debt and public spending. It was also the related recession. So that in the crisis countries, we saw public debt going up by up to 100% of GDP almost in Ireland, 60, over 60% in Spain and Portugal, and uh, almost 50% in, uh, in the UK. So these are huge increases. And when we look at the, um, the logic that this implies for, so to speak, our fiscal targets, public debt, um, I mean, if you add from a crisis 50, 60, 100% of GDP, it makes the 60% of Maastricht, the 60% debt threshold, perhaps not quite so unreasonable and quite so unreasonably low as some people today suggest. Also for the future, we will have uh, fiscal risks from the bank government loop where banks hold a lot of government debt. And if government gets into trouble, then the banks will be in trouble. And we have a lot of risks from the shadow banking sector. This became quite visible in the, um, in the March turmoil of last year when um, asset managers rapidly sold off uh, uh, um, a lot of assets because they were illiquid and uh, were, um, they had to uh, deal with uh, um, uh, the sales, the, the wishes of clients to sell stuff. And uh, that almost got even the government, the US government debt market to, uh, um, to get in trouble. In addition to asset managers, uh, corporates, uh, over indebted corporates are a big risk for governments because you, know, you can't afford a, Comp, uh, corporate bankruptcy wave, so governments uh, risk to be li become liable, and then we have underfunded pension funds as a possible fiscal risks from the financial system. So what does this mean, kind of from a normative perspective, when we think about the sustainability of public finances as a need for the future? Uh, fiscal rules to deal with deficit and debt biases, uh, like the stability and growth pact, the Schuldenbremse budgetary rule and institutions to keep governments efficient and financial uh, sector regulation to limit the fiscal risks coming from the financial sector. This is not a very, well, the financial regulation is prominent, but the other two dimensions of rules-based policymaking have not been too prominent lately. And I think the, the, the COVID crisis has reinforced this, uh, this, this um, these challenges, because while be, in 2019 public spending averaged, as I had said, about 44% of GDP in advanced countries, it shot up to about 52% in 2020. And you have France at 63, Italy at almost 60, and uh, then all these countries. I have the G7 countries plus Ireland and Switzerland here, UK, US, Spain, Germany, all near or above 50%. And historically, no country, no advanced country has sustainably raised more than 53% of GDP in revenue, none. There were short-term exceptions of 56, but you know, so you can see that Italy, France, these expenditure ratios are just not financeable. And here you can see how in just 13 years, 
public debt has gone up from 82% in the average of the G7 to 139. And with that, we are back at the level of the end of World War II um, without the prospect of high growth uh, and uh, low deficits to uh, get down from that. So with this, I want to conclude my presentation and uh, argue that perhaps the book is timely and the focus on expenditure analysis, getting better spending, more efficient spending, dealing with fiscal risks is not such a, so not such a bad proposition. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Lutke. Um, before handing over to Harold James, let me just uh, say that the Q&A section is open for our audience. And please, uh, if you have questions that we can discuss afterwards, uh, write them in the, the Q&A. I will bring them up and uh, manage a little bit the discussion then. So now, uh, Harold James, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Well, thank you so much, uh, Rainer. It's a great pleasure to be with you and uh, to be with the uh, IBF and the Center for Financial Studies and to discuss this really excellent book uh, that uh, Ludger Schuchnecht has, has just published. And as he said, it's, an, it's in some ways an updating of the important book that he did uh, together with Peter Tanzi uh, 20 years or, or so ago. Um, and it's interesting also in terms of the timing uh, in that it's a book, if you read it, that it was clearly written before the COVID crisis, uh, but uh, it's fascinating uh, to discuss it in the light of the trends that uh, Lutke was thinking about and presented in that, uh, that short presentation. The general theme of the book uh, that we generally in uh, democracies um, assess governments by the effectiveness of the performance, by the effectiveness of expenditure, I think is a very, very powerful one. And it's one that is uh, echoing around uh, in the last year uh, as governments respond in very, very different ways to the COVID crisis. And you can see people are always making comparisons. So the, the kind of comparative um, uh, exercise that uh, Luca Schuchnecht invites us to do uh, is, is really relevant uh, to th this one. Um, so I wanted to spend a few minutes uh, talking about that. Um, and then I wanted to go on and uh, think about this important uh, distinction uh, He's uh, given us, uh, Luke has given us a, a powerful vision of how uh, there are different ways of approaching these issues. And uh, you contrasted a classical with a Keynesian or a, um, a rules based uh, with a more discretionary uh, approach. And I think, um, you know, particularly. Today is a good day to be having that discussion because this is the day that uh, the House of Representatives is going, I think, uh, to pass the 1.9 trillion stimulus measure. Uh, and it's, it's going to be signed in, into law in, in, in the next few days. Um, uh, the, 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 this, this raises a tremendously important issue. And uh, uh, I, I would be interested, and I will come to that at the end of my uh, comments, um, whether we can't worry about it from a Keynesian perspective as well. Uh, because that phrase that Lutke concluded with, uh, that uh, no government uh, can live with a, a, a tax requirement that goes well over 50% of the, uh, the, the product, um, is actually one that you can find very neatly and powerfully expressed in the general theory. Uh, so it's, it's, it's one that, that Keynes in his most important work uh, made very graphically. So first of all, then uh, a question about how you measure the effectiveness of uh, government spending. That's, that's critical to the theme of the book. Um, and it seems to me it's easier in the two areas that we, we had about a bit uh, in uh, education uh, spending uh, and uh, what, what you do in the, in the exercises that you uh, 
you take PISA tests and other kinds of quantitative assessments of um, how, how students are doing in the schools and uh, measure that uh, and then compare it to the amount of government spending. Uh, health outcomes, uh, I think you could also do the same kind of exercise. Uh, uh, mortality rates are quite strikingly different in different countries. And one of the themes uh, of um, a lot of recent research, obviously the, the, the really famous book by now of my, my colleagues, uh, Angus Deaton and uh, Anne Case, um, about the way in which the, the, the long-standing move to higher life expectancy was reversed over the last uh, five or six years um, by deaths of despair. And uh, there's some indication that in some European countries you're seeing exactly that kind of thing. It, it's, it's, it's difficult because we're now interrupted by COVID. And so uh, you know, COVID is doing, uh, doing a lot of damage to, to, to everybody, but also to this, this kind of uh, approach. Um, uh, but you, 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 you can measure uh, things there. And uh, I, I think uh, you do a, a, a good job with that. Um, but it's really difficult to measure whether social spending is effective or not. And uh, that's the one that I think uh, gives the biggest, biggest headaches. Um, you demonstrate uh, in one of your charts that uh, increases in social spending are not correlated with increased satisfaction with government performance. And I can see that. And that in a way is an explanation of the classical kind of ratchet effect uh, that if, if you have a lot of social spending and it doesn't seem to be working very well, uh, one of the, I think, uh, almost automatic psychological mechanisms is then to say that you need more of it and you need to, you need to go further and uh, then you increase the dissatisfaction uh, and then you want to spend even more and you get yourself into a really terrible uh, doom loop. Um, but it, 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 it does seem to me striking and uh, you raised it also in the brief presentation um, in terms of comparing uh, Greece and Portugal as, as uh, reform experiments. And uh, the, the, the story of Greece is a story of a really unmitigated tragedy. Um, and uh, as you said, uh, the, the Portuguese uh, story by contrast uh, looks much more successful. Why is that? Um, it's not that the Greeks didn't try to do reforms. Uh, there, there's, there's, an, there's an enormous um, austerity effort. And you know, in, in part, you get back then to the story of um, when you're thinking about these ratios, uh, their ratios, the, there's a numerator and a denominator. And uh, the uh, denominator is the rate of growth. And so if you have a really strong collapse of growth, um, you you, 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 you do terrible things and you make it also more difficult uh, to do uh, effective reform. So I, 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 I wanted to ask about that one. Um, and then the, the second uh, area that I thought it would be good to discuss is the question of um, uh, thinking about where we are now um, and uh, what kind of spending uh, is is appropriate, and I think it would be interesting to to to, to have your your commentary uh, on this. Um, uh, do we need a Keynesian stimulus in 2020 and 2021? Um, and uh, we, we, we've had uh, Janet Yellen, uh, Treasury Secretary, uh, telling everybody to act big um, a week or so ago. Um, but if we look at measurements of where the output gap is, so, you know, I think they, uh, if you're raised in the Keynesian tradition, you think of output gaps and your output gaps also play a role in the way in which central banks think about their monetary policy. And uh, they're terribly difficult to measure. And uh, it's, it's fascinating also to go back and see how the output gaps that were calculated in 2008, 2009 at the height of the financial crisis have been revised in the light of growth performance since then. A lot depends on the growth performance uh, afterwards. But uh, the, uh, 
the, the current uh, estimates of the output gap uh, for the uh, the US uh, in 2020, um, 3.2, uh, 1.5 in 2021. Uh, so we're going down to a really small output gap, and it doesn't look as if you really want a or need a, um, a 1.9 trillion stimulus in, uh, in 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 that setting. Um, and in 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 in, the, in that setting, um, it's interesting also how this is being discussed because part of the discussion of the Eurozone debt crisis and the European response to the global financial crisis um, was in terms of debates about how big the the, uh, the, the, the the multiplier is. So we get another standard bit of the Keynesian apparatus. And uh, the argument uh, was that the multiplier uh, was underestimated and was much, much larger. And this is what then produces those terrible output gaps. Well, do they uh, really come from that, or is it from uh, you know another of the areas of risk that you mentioned, the contribution of a financial crisis to uh, undermining uh, expectations and thinking about revising the expectations of the future? But in the current discussion, um, the the argument is almost precisely reversed. Uh, that uh, people who are pushing for a strong stimulus uh, say, don't worry about it because the multiplier is really, really small. Um, and uh, in fact, people won't spend the stimulus checks. Uh, stimulus checks seems an odd way of doing about it. You know, I, I, I think you know, if you live in, in Luca's world, uh, you think, well, you know, this is the moment for extremely effective targeted government expenditure to get the output of vaccines really pushed up. I mean, that, that's effective expenditure. Uh, but a lot of stimulus uh, is, is that effective expenditure. And why is it being done? Is it not being done actually in response to a discussion about social stability and uh, social instability? And uh, it's that rather than the need uh, to uh, to, to actually combat a, a particular health crisis uh, that is driving this debate. Um, and you know, the fact that it's driving this debate seems to me to actually vindicate uh, a lot of Lutka's really powerful arguments. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James. Um, um, Lutka, would you like to reply? Maybe briefly, because I think these are very important points. Yeah. Um, on the social spending and measurement, so to speak, of the spending itself and the impact, I, I agree with her. I mean, all of these indicators are approximations and hopefully on average do the assessment reasonable uh, justice. But even in individual cases, this not may not be the case. Um, and um, I think that... Uh, the weighting is also, of course, important. I mean, if, if income distribution is your only indicator, say, then you would get a different result than if, you know, you say, I mean, everybody is his own Lucas Schmidt, is, is, you know, is responsible for himself, and then you weight other things. But the, the role of growth is, is a very important one because this kind of negative loop of low growth stipulating more social spending that then doesn't have the effect because the government is simply not effective in any way. Uh, I, th I think that is true for some countries. I think that is, in a way, the, the growth, reforming the framework conditions of countries for the private sector and for government will, so to speak, help with both, you know, getting more growth, more effective spending, and then less pressure for social spending. So this, the book doesn't do enough justice to this complex thought, but I think it hints at it. The second point is on the kind of what to do now and with what kind of spending. And I, I don't want to comment too much on the US. I'm also a bit surprised that about the size of the stimulus, given that the pockets of people are full of money and the moment they can spend it, a lot of it will be spent. Um, but what is lurking behind it is, of course, the, the same concern about 
okay, government in the past has not always spent the money well. But to me, one of the challenges is, will it improve? You know, I mean, a lot of the normative requests for more stimulus, more spending are then tied up with a half sentence saying, if it is on productive public investment, then it will have, you know, all these positive confidence and growth effects and short-term demand effects. But if it didn't do so in the past, why should it do so in the future? Um, because I see, I mean, I've worked for the finance ministry in Germany and we've always been confronted with a request to spend more on infrastructure, but we just couldn't. The, 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 the environment wasn't, we had all these complex processes, these veto players and so on. So to, so to my mind, I mean, what, what we try to do is two things. First, structurally, change the structures put a lot of the investment spending in this, for instance, on, in, on roads into this new infrastructure company, and then give a strong role to the private sector, because it's not the government that has to build the power lines or the broadband infrastructure, the private sector can do it, and then have targeted subsidies, which, is a, which the government, to my mind, is much better able than to actually be involved in these kind of semi-private activities. But that, that links up to the issue of multiplier, you know, if the government spends more, uh, I'm not sure the multipliers will be high. It might be better if the government says, here's some money for the private sector to spend more. Um, and um, your point about social stability, I think, especially in the European response package, you know, with this European credit uh, lending and grant finance uh, spending, I think that, that, that is indeed a, a, an important point social stability, and if and I have nothing against the governments in a way bribing their populations or Europe bribing the governments that need reforms with this money, as long as the reforms then happen. But I think the, the idea that it's the demand stimulus side of this that is the benefit, that is wrong. It is the hopeful structural effect that, that can actually have the, pos the strong positive impact of this package. Okay, thank you very much. We have a couple of questions asking for your view on the modern monetary theory uh, and its uh, role that it can play in fiscal policy considerations. Probably triggered by the discussion in the US. That's. Uh... Uh, I mean, it's true that in the recent past, we haven't had inflationary pressures from very expansionary monetary policies and big fiscal imbalances. But that doesn't mean it is like that in the future. And I think that um, simply to assume that if you, um, you know, have higher deficits, you can basically deal with it through central banks uh, is, is, is not a sustainable policy path. It's, you really risk to lose confidence. I mean, all this depends on the assumption that at the, on the one time you do irresponsible policies, but on the other hand, the population doesn't react by withdrawing confidence, getting out of the currency, raising inflation expectations or such. And I think this, this approach works in specific short-term settings, but it's not for the medium or long-term. Okay, then we have one question that, that relates to your, the figures that you presented on Switzerland. Um, and uh, it's questions whether uh, you, you or it's, uh, it's asked whether you just uh, have the figures on the general government or all the other political levels because the figures seem to be quite low and is that due to just uh, leaving out cantons and and other parts of the of the government in Switzerland no the, these these are figures that i get from amico i mean the the uh, historic figures for up to 2017 are oecd figures because they have all these countries and the figures for 2020-21 are IMF figures, which, I, which also systematically are consistent with OECD and commission figures, and they comprise general government. Um, so some of the figures in the some of the figures in the book refer to averages when it comes to measuring performance. I look at 10-year averages of spending and 10-year averages of performance spending before because you know infrastructure spending is not relevant from one year to affect indicators but you you need to um, look at longer horizons but the individual quotes of numbers all refer to general government 
Yeah, then you, you uh, said that uh, countries with a medium-sized public sector are, in most cases, the, the, the less efficient ones. Why, why is that so? What, what's your explanation for that? <laughs> well, the, the, the distinction in small, medium and large is, 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 is a presentational device. Small is below 40, large is above 50, and then you have the medium in between. And then you, you know, with 22 countries, what you have, you have like six, seven, eight countries in each group. So um, the, the medium size, that's Italy, that's also Spain, that's also Portugal, Greece. Um, so I think you have a bit of a bias in there also, uh, in the sense, but you also have Germany, the Netherlands in there. So you have some good, good performance as well. Um, if when when you go down to the to the details, um, you'll see that the the more important lesson to my mind is that you can have quite small government, and Singapore, Korea are even more extreme examples. Quite small government that still provide a perfectly sound framework of public goods and services and social safety nets, and still work extremely well and often provide the better incentives for people and have are the more stable, more happy communities. Ireland, I would add to that as well. And then you have the large government countries where you have the Nordics, and then you have France and, you know, and uh, then you have to ask yourself, why are the Nordics successful? And I think uh, the, some people say the Nordics are the rule why big government works. And I would say the Nordics are the exception. They have good institutions, they manage to have a lot of spending with good institutions and relatively homogeneous societies. And they, so they managed to, 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 do, to get both done, um, so to speak, uh, big social services, big transfers without much damage to growth. It's more that message. In that middle income, in that middle government group, you don't have these kind of extreme cases. There's really a lot of Germany, I would say, is, 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 is a good, well-performing country, but not top. It's got a big government, but not top. So you have a lot of that in that group. Yeah, there were two questions that asked for the way out of the currently so high uh, level of public debt. Uh, you said we arrived again at the post-World uh, War II level of indebtedness. What, what are the way, ways out? And one... one uh, um, person asks, especially whether there will be, where will, there's the risk of inflationary process in the near future, and how big do you see that risk? Um, I think for the big government countries, expenditure restraint will have to happen. You may like it or not. Even if your spending ratio in France to in the recovery goes down again from 63 to 60 or 58 or 57, you, 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 you're otherwise bound to have large deficits and very high taxes. Um, for a country like the US, it's a bit different because you ha your spending is not so high. Uh, so you could raise taxes, but the political environment is very difficult. And if the political environment doesn't allow you to get more taxes, sorry, then your way out will also need to be to have less spending. And then the question is, what do you cut? Do you cut your productive spending, your investment, your education or whatnot? Or do you look at where the inefficient stuff is? And politically, of course, we all know that social spending is quite dominant. And we'll all have a difficult political discussion ahead of us in how, how we, sh how, how we should, should can deal with it. I mean, this will be very hard for politicians in an environment of low growth to discuss how to contain, especially social spending, to protect uh, investment and infrastructure spending, to raise revenue when you are also in a competitive world with the Asian countries, you know, which spend 20 or 30 percent of GDP and have much lower taxes and draw the talent. Uh, so, so I, I personally think we we have to rise to the challenge um, and not hide ourselves behind some phony debate over the need for even more spending and more government. Uh, it's it, you may like that normatively, but I think the positive reality is uh, is is going to be a different one. And my fear is that um, with such high deficits in debt, 
the, the temptation is to try to solve the debt problem with financial repression. You know, burden on the, the burden on the ECB. I, I just a few days ago heard one of the chief economists of a major European central bank saying, when I asked, you know, how, how shall we get out of the debt? He said, the ECB. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a solution? If you, if you manage to keep interest rate at zero for 10 years and inflation at 2%, you shrink the debt quite a bit. That's true, but it has major distribution implications that are not uh, innocent. But it may also not work because all the factors that bring down in, brought down inflation over the past decade uh, will either dissipate or even reverse. The demographics are gonna be bad. They're gonna be good for labor, but to my mind, mm -hmm. not good for inflation. Mm -hmm. The effects of the high liquidity that we have generated, and in this crisis, we have generated a lot of liquidity that might actually become relevant for demand, is not disinflationary. The global economy uh, and the, the, the supply chains, the value chains, um, and this idea to have more national production and kind of hopefully we will not have major protection, but we will not have this, this big global push through globalization. So the disinflationary effect from that will also dissipate. And combine that with the deficits, uh, possibly lower savings ratios with population aging. So you may get into a mix that actually looks a bit like that, what Goodhart and Pradhan in their new book describe that there is actually going to be inflationary pressure and then let these two interact and the central banks are going to be in a big conundrum. Uh, so, so to my mind, as economists, we should also think how much of a burden on the independence of central banks and price stabilities will be put in the future from the fiscal side. So to me, it's not like, okay, we should coordinate fiscal stimulus and monetary stimulus, but it's to think more about, okay, how we can, how we can keep fiscal policies sustainable so that they don't become a burden for central banks and their challenges in the future. Yeah, what you, what you just said relates nicely to a question here on fiscal rules. Um, nearly every fiscal rule in the euro area was obeyed during the last two decades. With regard to those experiences, how can the confidence in fiscal rules be justified or, or regained, I may add? Uh, I mean, I would, um, I, I, I claim myself the same idealistic blindness as those who say we should spend more on the right things and then everything will be fine. I say uh, we, we need fiscal rules. And um, yes, uh, the question then is how do we get them implemented? I think it's less a question of, you know, should they be fine tuned this way or that way? I think our the stability and growth back framework is broadly fine and the German debt break is broadly fine, but they have to be implemented. And we shouldn't bigger, bicker about the technical details. And that will be the big challenge in Europe. For the US, I don't know. Maybe Harold has an idea how, how the US can manage to get in this direction. For Europe, they have, to my mind, we have to think about how we get the governance to work and not the people in the commission say, we want to go in the opposite direction. Harold, would you, would you like to add something to that? Of fiscal rules? Well, uh... I, I, I mean, I think you, you, you have to deal with the, uh, the, the political circumstance that the appetite for fiscal rules has just completely vanished. And um, that, uh, you know, in, in a sense, uh, COVID is pushing you more in this direction to abandon them, because uh, the, the more you think that something is exceptional, um, the more I think it's justified, you know, that, that, that really is the traditional uh, Keynesian argument. But if you have an exceptional state that goes on forever and ever, uh, then you, you really blow up the, the possibility of having fiscal rules. And the, then the question is, we, we find it very, very difficult uh, to think of a way of determining what the time point is when we want to return to normality and we want to get, get back to a situation that is not uh, abnormal. Uh, but for the moment, you know, I think that's particularly true in the United States and it's true for political reasons as well. Uh, it's being driven by the sense that this is completely abnormal and you need high levels of spending uh, 
uh, to make sure that you don't have a social breakdown, uh, that the outcome of the election in two years' time is the right one, and so on. Yeah, then, then a question that reminds us that there are, of course, um, people who, who um, uh, give reasons or give arguments for a bigger state. Um, the first one is uh, Larry Summers uh, saying that the state needs to turn a private sector saving surplus into demand. And the second is uh, Matsukato saying that the state is an effective entrepreneur and need to take a lead in innovation. What would you think about these arguments? Uh, um, this is, these are difficult arguments. Um, I mean, it's true that public, that private investment has declined as a share of GDP in the past two or three decades. Private savings in the West haven't really gone up a little bit maybe, but then, then to my mind, the question is, okay, I mean, perhaps our framework conditions are not so conducive enough to private investment. Maybe they, they maybe, you know, it's not like raising public spending and reducing public savings in order to make up for private savings, but perhaps better for growth would be if the private sector saw, um, you know, more opportunities to grow. And um, that, that, that would be more my take on this, that the structural decline on growth that we have observed for decades will not be reversed with a kind of a demand stimulus from the government. Um, as regards the uh, role of government as an entrepreneur, I, I think one can take two angles on that. Um, the government, even if you are like a classical economic thinker or the liberal German type, you know, it doesn't mean the government shouldn't do anything. It means the government should sit, set framework conditions. And that can include support of, you know, it includes basic research, of course, but it should, could include also, like it's done in Germany for a decade, the targeted support of research of uh, certain strategic sectors and so on. I mean, like the hydrogen strategy that we have, the renewable energy strategy, the carbon pricing and emissions trading, you know, these are all ways um, to, to, to steer the economy in a certain way because we want to produce certain global or, and national public goods. Um, but the question is, how do you do it? I mean, should the government choose to invest in a battery factory or should the government have a general framework that uh, provides uh, incentives for research in an area where then people, you know, choose, uh, uh, develop their ideas like we have seen with BioNTech, you know, the, the vaccine that has been developed out of cancer research. I mean, the, the government would never have had the idea to promote this particular, they came in later with the money once the vaccine was there, but they would not have had the idea. They don't know, they're not the better entrepreneurs. So I think the answer to that Matsukato question is, is, a compli is, is complicated because conceptually you could easily say framework conditions but not be an entrepreneur. But what that means in practice is, is not so clear, not so easy, and one, one should not judge policymakers too negatively. But still, I think the environment, uh, the, 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 the general principle that we should create an environment that is conducive to research and innovation that is better than the government picking certain industries as the future winners. Yeah. Uh, adding to that, do, do you see a model of a good cooperation between private sector and public sector in the sense of a so-called partnership with a common purpose? Uh, my experience is that um, when a minister listens to the chief of a large corporation, the coordination and cooperation that comes out of it tends to be not totally unbiased. Um, and it's typically more about getting privileges than about creating the best framework conditions. So um, yes, I think in a way, um, if you have an, a, a, a representation system that is kind of making sure that small and medium-sized companies are also well represented and take part in a dialogue on what the best framework conditions are. I think it's better than the personal dialogue between the minister and the top five companies. 
Um, so, I mean, this, this, I, th I definitely, there is a, I mean, it all happens through dialogue. Um, but whether that dialogue uh, and cooperation leads to productive outcomes or unproductive ones, that depends. And I mean, the government also, we have a long tradition now in many countries of public private partnerships in the production of certain goods and services, which has, where, where have been huge mistakes in many places. But now we are in a, pl in a space where I think we actually know pretty well what works and with what governance structures. There's a new book by the IMF that uh, with some World Bank participation, others that, that gives very practical hints there. So, so I think, yes, there is a lot of scope, but um, it's, to get it right is not self-evident. Mm -hmm. Then there is a question, is there a link between successful public spending and the level of corruption? Very interesting question. Yeah, the, 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 the rule of law index that I have com yeah. contains a, or the governance index that I have contains an, the co corruption as one of the elements. And um, it is indeed the case that co countries with low corruption tend to have more effective, more productive and more effective government spending. Um, that, 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 is, that is clear, yeah. I, yeah, okay, then, then a question where I would maybe also invite uh, Harold to, to give an answer because it, uh, it asks, uh, is it well known that in Singapore and Korea, a lot of the social services are provided within the families as this reduces social government expenditure, overall government spending is small compared to other current uh, countries. How are you dealing with so societal idiosyncrasies in your framework? Maybe that relates also to historical developments. If you say that Singapore and Korea are maybe now in a state where Germany and other countries were like, like 40 years ago, shouldn't we not expect also a move towards higher social security spending as, as we have it seen it in, in Germany? Do you want me to start or Harold? Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe you start, Ludger, and then. Um, you know. I, I mean, the, the role of families is, is differs strongly across countries. Um, and and um, I mean, still some countries with very high social spending like Italy seem to, families still seem to play a very important role. While when you look at the number of children in Singapore and Korea, it's small and it's true families play an important role, but. I think also the kind of the, the risk and production of, of social services, perhaps still to a bigger extent in the private sector. Um, and that may have to do that we, um, that they did not participate in the first wave of the Keynesian revolution. And now they're looking also carefully what institutional mistakes they should avoid to get on into the same dynamics as us. That's at least the understanding I have when I talk to people from from the region that they, they see very well that the welfare state in these countries, there will be pressure to build up the welfare state, but to build it up in an incentive compatible manner that is financeable and, and doesn't create these, these dynamics of unsatisfiable demands that ever rise forever. Uh, they, they will have a huge challenge with that definitely, but maybe also they learned from some of our mistakes. Good, good point. Harold, would you have an? So, so I, I, I mean, I think it relates actually to the, those broad trends that uh, Luca was thinking of at the beginning of the presentation. That uh, you know, by and large, uh, with declining family size, um, then the expectation is that there is more done by the welfare system and by social transfers, and uh, so. Uh, the, the story of the rise of the welfare state is very, very intricately linked uh, to the story of the decline of fertility and the uh, move to um, much smaller families. And it's particularly striking, I think, in Italy or Spain or uh, Germany as well. But um, it's spectacularly true in China. So, uh, you know, in, in, in China, I think that's, that's where you're going to have the biggest of these issues that... Um, uh, you know, one-child policy is not a good way of 
providing a family-based uh, sustained old age and you will get the demands from the from the uh, welfare system to provide more there's also a willingness to to work longer and to adapt in a way privately to the challenges i this is the, the, the knack of kind of having to find solutions for yourself that i think is still there more strongly than here and i i i, I agree fully with what harold with what you were saying um but uh um that 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 I think still is something we 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 sh we should perhaps learn from in reverse from Asia. Yeah, the question reminded me of the debate um, that was uh, um, uh, that was raised by uh, Adolf Wagner at the beginning of the 20th century that led to Wagner's law in the German context, also foreseeing that uh, with the social um, changes and an increase in the educational system there there would be an irresistible growth in in public spending and uh, so uh, i think that that's 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 nice that we are back into that discussion and uh, of course we should not uh, stick to those iron laws but but uh, always uh, try to to uh, challenge uh, whether this is really what what we need yeah, I think that that was a wonderful um, point to to close this this session. Um, sorry that we could not take up all questions, but I think we did most of them. Um, maybe I can invite Ludger and uh, Harold for just a few closing remarks. I, I don't have more to say except that I hope that this you found this fascinating if not to even look into the book <laughs> yeah well. absolutely it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating book and i think the you know the, the 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 question is at the moment in the face of a short term emergency how you set the points correctly in order to make sure that you don't endanger a longer term uh, prospect okay so thank you very much to both of you, Ludger and Harold, and uh, thanks for all the participants and uh, those who um, were involved also in the discussion. Um, I close the session now. As I said in the beginning, we have recorded everything and the slides that uh, Ludger presented will also be made available together with the video um, in, over the websites of uh, CFS and uh, IBF. So thanks for joining us and uh, enjoy the evening. Thank you very much.